There's about 35,000 of us guys out here at Mare Island. We're working 24 hours a day fixing up busted ships and building new ones. Talk about your total war effort. Brother, we got it here at Mare Island. Hello, everybody. I'm Justin Crosley. I'm Ryan Gibbons. Kent Fortner. And this is Battleships to Beer, 10 years of Mare Island Brewing Company. And we're on to episode five, boys. We're getting through this, aren't we? (laughs) Five. I remember our five-year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it seem like ages ago? At least five years ago. (laughs) (laughs) See, business is weird. I guess life is weird that way. That Sometimes five years feels like five years. Sometimes it feels like six months. Yes, that's right. For sure. just, I keep I keep looking at like ten years, and half of me is like, "All right, that doesn't seem like very long." And then some days I'm like, "Man, it seems like it's been a century." And then I look back at the pictures of you and I from ten years ago, and I'm like, "Who are those kids? <laughs> Who are those kids?" Yeah. Way less gray hairs in my beard back then. <laughs> yeah, that is how time moves in business for sure. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, okay, I don't want to say that it were that important, but. You know, you look back at, at presidents when they come into office and when they leave office. Like like photos of oh, Obama yeah. oh, when he yeah. came into oh, office yeah. are incredibly different than when he left, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> what work does to us. Yes. Why can't we all be trust fund kids? Well, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you get what you get out of what you put into it. So if you give it your all, I guess you come up with a few gray hairs. There That's you the go. way it works. I like that sure. attitude. All right. So... Um, I need an anchor update. I'll tell you that. I know I keep it. I'm so fascinated with this anchor story. Um, and then, you know, if you're just tuning in for the first time here on episode five, I do recommend you go back to the beginning. There's some ongoing themes here. But one of them is that uh, a mysterious and, and hopefully very historical anchor uh, magically showed up right outside the Mare Island Brewery. And uh, what's this week's update? I, you know, I don't have a great update for you just because... Basically, we've got the sort of ownership of the anchor figured out. It's going to live with the foundation. We're basically going to try to figure out a way to display it. But we're in this slightly weird situation where if we just put it out there to display it, A, it's going to continue to rust. And B, it's kind of sharp. And we got a lot of kids around the tap room. Uh, we don't want somebody to get, you know, what, what is it when you get cut by something rusty, uh, tetanus, you know, yeah, off of this anchor. Right. So i um, been talking to a few restoration folks, and one of them is actually golfing in Scotland for the next few weeks. And so I'm trying to get an expert in here who can say, here's how you clean it up. Here's how you preserve it before you put it out that will take away the sharp angles and, and just kind of restore it. And it's, you know, it, it's part of the fun of being uh, owner of a business is you're constantly doing these deep dives into random stuff that you never would have done otherwise. And now right. I'm becoming an expert on, on how things rust basically. And it's not just a matter of going down to Home Depot and spraying it with rust oleum. I can you know, tell you though work. that, uh, there's definitely been a lot of customers that have heard the story oh, now and God. they're coming in and they're like, so where's that anchor? You yeah. Know? They it's, know. Where, it's, it's just the stories out there. The anchor's not ready to be shown. So, yeah, so I don't know what this may take us a month or two, I think to get this thing out and it's so heavy. Yeah, right. We can't really hang it from the rack rafters with, uh, without compromising the rafters. So we're trying to figure out exactly how do you display something like this? At the See, and I kind of wondered about that too, because you know, you're, you guys are always trying to do this to make the history part of sure. it, uh, part of the experience when you go to Mare Island, when you go to Mare Island Brewing Company. But sometimes these endeavors of yours, I feel like might, you know, you, you find this anchor, you, it feels like a stroke of luck. Right. Until you have to spend $40,000 right, right. to display it and, in a way that people don't get hurt. And I'm like, oh, it's like a blessing and a curse that you guys have. It might just be a picture by the, at the end of the day hanging on the wall. <laughs> you know, This is right. what the anchor looked like. This yeah. is the story behind it. But. Yeah. I have a friend who, when we, were, when we were young and we were in high school, and he had this bulletin board. It was the entire side of his, of his room. And he would put up pictures mostly of, of rock stars and stuff like that. And he would fill it all up. And it would take him about two months. It was super cool. You'd go over his room and you'd see what he'd put up recently. It's like a giant collage. And then when he got done, he'd take a picture of that and he'd put that picture down. He'd clear it all off, put that picture down the corner and he would start all over again. And by the time we graduated, he had like pictures, you know, it was almost like a Monet painting from a a teenage, whatever. So I sometimes feel like the brewing company is also almost like that in terms of like, we've got so much stuff. We've got to figure out how to encapsulate it down into like a little dot of information while we keep expanding on all this stuff. That's a really weird analogy. Perfectly. Yeah. I love it. All right. I, I do have another update for you, though. Okay. Did a little research. We had been talking about whether Farragut, who entered the Navy at the age of nine, and I believe he had a 60-year uh, career in the Navy, was the longest-serving naval officer. Yeah, I wanted to know. Turns out it wasn't him. A gentleman by the name of Rickover. Uh, and I actually live uh, two blocks from Rickover Street. There's a street on, on Mare Island named after Rickover. 
Rick Over was known as the father of the nuclear Navy, and he uh, served for two years longer than Farragut. And wow, he was apparently quite the quite the ball buster, for lack of a better term. And people don't have a lot of positive things to say about him that worked with him. Interesting, but man, he was a he was a figure in history. And he, I mean, hey, here's an intro for you. He's mm-hmm. part of Ivy Bell's. Should we oh, should we crack some beer? Yeah. I do have a question, though, just yeah, yeah. so you don't move on from, yeah, from yeah. his tenure. I'm going to assume that he stayed two years at the end, longer at the end of his career rather than having started at seven Correct. instead of nine. Correct. Okay. <laughs> I don't know the exact date he went in, but I think he was quite a bit older when he got out. Okay. That's what happened. Yeah, yeah, I think he was in his 70s, 80s when he got yes, out. Yes, he was. And yeah. if, if you look him up, he's, you know, full Wikipedia page and... He looks a little dour, actually, in the in the photo, but he apparently had a huge impact on uh, on Mare Island history and, and American history, including Ivy Bells. What do you got there, Ryan? Yeah, I was going to say that was a good segue here. So uh, we've got our Ivy Bells Pilsner for you guys to enjoy uh, today. This is uh, it's sound. a it's a great story from the um, from the Cold War, and so we uh, we decided to make a uh, German style pilsner here that is uh, of course cold fermented, and um, it is a classic, like I say, German style, five point one percent, and it is for sure my everyday sipper if I am out and about. All right, Ren. So. Um I'm happy to tell a little bit of the history story, but tell me what the icon looks like on the Ivy Bell's pills. Yeah, so on the icon on this one, we've got a uh, a little scuba diver, and he's in classic gear. He's got the fins on and, and the mask, and he's holding on to what looks like a rope or a cable. So, yeah, oh, what is that? that is excellent, mysterious uh, lead-in. I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. So there is a building on Mare Island that we refer to as the Pink Palace, and my understanding is that it's pink because it is pink. It's actually kind of beige, I guess, would be the color. But it's uh, pink because it's got uh, 10 layers of mesh painted over with iron oxide paint that has rusted. I guess that's part of our theme here is rusting yeah. <laughs> over the years. And it's turned it a little bit red. And the reason it has all that is because they didn't want any surveillance during the Cold War through these walls of this building. And because what was going inside. Now, there's a sign outside it that says ocean engineering. And if you talk to some of the, the guys who worked on the island, particularly some of the ones that were there a long time, They'll talk about having having worked in ocean engineering, but when you ask them what they did, they clam up entirely. And so ocean engineering was the moniker on the outside. Inside was basically the precursor to the CIA and to the um, NSA. And what they were doing down there, uh, why well, they did a lot of different things, but one of the main ones was Operation Ivy Bells. Hmm. And this is, I don't know if this is formally declassified or not. It's I've not, heard, but there's, there's, the information's out here. There's a whole book about it. In fact, go Google this right now and get on Amazon. It's called Blind Man's Bluff. It's a fantastic read. And I, I read it. I went back to some guys I know that, that worked in ocean engineering, and I'm like, hey, you've got to tell me about this. And they're like, nope, nope, not going to tell you about it. I was like, wow. you, I was like there's a book written about it. What are you, you're in the book. What yeah, are you talking about? like, well, but, that wasn't me. So basically, um, the way I understand it is during the Cold War, where Moscow is and where the main naval uh, base is for the Soviet Union, there's a sea between that. And Rickover, our guy we've been talking about Mm -hmm. rick over figures that or postulates that there has to be a communication cable between moscow and this naval base that Ah. goes underneath this water so he outfits a submarine on mare island to sneak over into soviet waters this is at the height of the cold war mind you we have no business being over there and sends this sub around the outside of this sea looking basically just with the periscope up looking for a sign in russian that says warning cable crossing here got it just to try to find it yeah he finds the sign. He finds the cable. Uh, not him, but the submarine the does. Sub, yeah. They go down into, I think it's 400 feet deep of water total. And by the way, this sub was rigged to self-destruct. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Self-destruct if it was found because it was felt like this mission was so important and it would compromise the Cold War detente with the Soviets so wow. badly. So, so almost a suicide mission. Well, yeah, I mean, if they got caught, it was for yeah. sure. Yeah. So they're down in 400 feet deep of water. And they eject this uh, two divers through, I believe, the torpedo tubes was the deal, and also this device, and they clamp it onto that that cable, and they leave a recording device on it. And then every six months, they'd have to send another sub back to swap oh, wow. out the recording um, tape, if you will. I don't know exactly what the medium was. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't a DVD. It wasn't an MP3. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it certainly wasn't wireless. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so they they um, would bring it back to Maryland, transcribe it, and send it over. And my understanding is is that Reagan used to literally read these readouts before he would go in to talk to Brezhnev because um, Moscow, the Soviets, they thought this cable was so secure that they never encoded anything going through it. And mm. we basically knew everything that the 
the Pentagon equivalent in Moscow was saying to the head of the Navy in my, in, in the Soviet Union wow. for nine years. That That's this, incredible. This went on. I think and the crazy thing is, is that the guys on the submarine had no idea where none, they are. No, none. I mean, you're in a submarine. There's no windows. And, you know, you, again, we don't have GPS on it at that time. And so these guys are just out doing their jobs. But in the in the meantime, it's like the most important information they're getting during the Cold War yeah. for, for uh, the Russian relations. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah I, I, one of my favorite parts, if you go read Blind Man's Bluff, and I'm, I, it's been a couple of years, but I'm going to get this mostly right. The whole story opens with a guy, a drunk sailor, mm. at the Horse and Cow, which is doesn't exist anymore. The building's still there, but the, the business isn't. But it was the debauchery naval sailors bar in, uh, in bar. Vallejo. And apparently Vallejo. There's, there's some, the Horse and Cow, they think they have a couple of them at different naval um, Correct. towns around, around. I think there's one in Guam that's still going, maybe, and there used to be one in Seattle, but not suitable for work, but if you want to Google the horse and cow Vallejo uh, submariners rights of initiation, you'll see something that'll shock the hell out of you if you want to look <laughs> it up. But anyway, they um, the, the whole book opens with this guy in apparently, I guess he was in a phone booth at the horse and cow, sailor drunk as hell, trying to call the White House and get through the White House um, switchboard to congratulate the president on this awesome, super secret mission that they're all doing out here for Operation oh, Eagles. Wow. And they're, the, the White House is calling the head of the island and saying, you need to get the MPs over there right now and drag this guy's ass out of this. Um, before of that's intercepted. Before this all going on. <laughs> yeah. And so um, that's how the whole blind man's bluff starts. And then it goes through the whole thing. And, it, and you just like it, for me, the thing about this, this history stuff is that it's hard for me to comprehend what was going on during the Cold War, how scared we were, how close right. we were, everything that was happening. And these guys were in the middle of all this stuff. And some of them knew what they were doing. Some of them did not. There was apparently four people on each one of those submarines that went over there that actually knew what was happening. It was like the radio man, the the um, captain, and then like two guys that were from this NSA, CIA, CIA kind of thing. They're the only four on the boat that knew what the hell was going on. Everybody else found out later right. that they, they had been over in Soviet waters digging this stuff up. So... I agree with you that placing yourself there is very difficult. I mean, it's obviously called a war, the Cold mm -hmm. War, and we know about it and we know these things that happen, but it doesn't feel like the other wars at all. However, it's probably equally, if not more terrifying, just in different ways than other wars, right? Like, like you're saying, if they were found doing this, the escalation of the Cold War could have led to the worst war ever. Right. A nuclear war. Absolutely. And so, yeah, just kind of thinking about the cold. It's almost I, I suppose I know why it's named, but there was not much cold about it. It's it was terrifying. Right. Right. You right, know, right. right, right. It's, it's, you know, this whole idea of mutually assured destruction, mad. Mm -hmm. And that was the, you know, during World War Two, the race was to go defeat Hitler and defeat, defeat the Japanese. Right. The race during the Cold War was we have to stay ahead of the Soviets. We have to have more submarine boats off their shores with more ICBMs aimed at them yes. than they have aimed at us. Otherwise, we're not a deterrent. And that race, I mean, it's insane if you think about it from it just really a pure, is. just spiritual concepts, like the, the amount of destruction. But, you know, they, they felt like they were doing the right thing. And yeah. it was maybe the only thing that you could do back then. I don't know. It was a true. I mean, it did deter. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think I mentioned uh, this young lady that helped us uh, name the hydraulic sandwich. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, she, yeah. uh, she actually worked in OE in that building. And um, she's there's a reason why she said if she told me what she did, she'd have to kill me because <laughs> she actually was in the room when all of these. Uh, missions were put together and wow. uh, crazy enough she stopped by the brewery the yeah. other day which was great to see her again and uh you know it, she was with her son and she's like yeah you know that beer is the one that i, I helped name and just again she's still to this day i was like so tell me a little more she's like i i, I don't know what you're talking about i can't Amazing. i can't tell you and, you know again i don't want to i don't want to say she's old or anything but probably in her late, late 60s yeah. or mid 70s experience experienced yeah experienced <laughs> but um she did say that you know, when she, her job was to go around into the rooms and put out all of these, um, what did she say, the TSS, I guess they were, their top secret uh, memos around. And she said all the highest brass were in there. And so she afterwards, it was her job to make sure every one of those memos came back. Wow. And yeah. she said that um, apparently the one guy who was in charge of the whole program under Rickover was uh, didn't want to give the, the memos back. And she's like, uh, sir, you're going to give me those back. And she took them from him. Amazing. And then he went to her boss and said, whoever that is, she needs to stay in here because she's a tough one. Oh, but yeah. she's, yeah. And yeah. understands her job and, and her role. Yeah. And she didn't know who he was, but afterwards uh, she, she knew exactly who he was. But yeah. 
I love hearing this stuff, too, because it can often feel like it's just the stuff of movies, right? <laughs> but it's clearly not. There's no. nothing uh, theatrical about it. No. It's just another day in the office in OE, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a quick break, because I know we've got more to talk about, more beer to talk about, and more history of Mare Island Brewing Company. So hang in there. We'll be right back. All right, Ryan, it's your turn. Uh-oh. All right. Max has written you a gem for you to read. Here you go. All right. Let's see what you got here. Hi, I'm Ryan Gibbons, co-founder of Mare Island Brewing Co., and I'm here to tell you about our delicious German-style pilsner, Ivy Bells. Did you know it comes in 16-ounce cans? Well, it does. Ivy Bells Pilsner. We can it so you don't have to. All right. <laughs> Yeah, all right, Max. Good one. That's it. I mean, that's a legit commercial. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah, he's being yeah. serious. For... I thought it was going to be for toothpaste or something. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Battleships to Beer. Ten years of Mare Island Brewing Company. You know, I didn't get to mention before the break uh, the delicious beer. Of course, we learned the tale of uh, Ivy Bell's, and and Ryan, you described it very well as a, a wonderful pilsner. But this is a great beer. And I can see why it's your kind of go-to. Well, one, you know, as you, as you, I don't know about you guys out there, if you own a brewery or been to a brewery, you know, everybody likes to enjoy a high-octane IPA. But sure. I, for me, I'm in my mid-40s at this point. Yeah, you start stuttering. Yeah, no, I'm 40. stuttering. Yeah, it's almost like an alcoholic <laughs> shake here. But <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the more beer I, the older I get, I like a lower alcohol beer because I enjoy drinking. It's not that right. because I need it, but I enjoy, you know, having conversations around it and, being with friends, and one thing you can't do at a 7.1 is have a lot of conversations. No, that yeah. at least makes sense. <laughs> right, they're yeah. not sensible yeah. conversations. So at a 5.1% um, Pilsner, you can definitely c- carry on, and so that's it. That's that's the intent of this guy. No, it's really nice. It goes down easy, but it's also, it's got plenty of body to it, um, yeah. and that's it, it's got its full mouth feel. So yeah, you're having lower alcohol, but you are getting uh, like the full beer experience, I like to call it. It's, it's definitely beer-flavored beer. <laughs> Uh, you know, we might have to use that as a slogan. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can I tie back to something from a previous episode real yeah. quick? Steve Togner, who's very dear to us and, uh, runs the electrician. He's the electrician on the Island. He runs an electrical shop. Great guy. Um, Steve. I mean, so he, this was after he had already done all the electrical on our brewery. So we had probably spent, I don't know, 30 hours with this guy or something talking about things and working through things and everything else. I mean, it'd been a long time. Ryan used to borrow his trailer all the time, still does. He was a part of Think Tank, if you remember. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's actually a a wine drinker, but we we had a bottle of wine for him. He also likes Whistle Pig, if I remember right. That's true. He does enjoy a Whistle Pig. But just one day, we're standing there, and I'm talking about Ivy Bells because we're getting ready to brand it and release it and everything else. And he's like, oh, yeah, I was on that sub. We were like, what? Just out of the blue? Yeah. And I'm like, you got to give me some more detail than that. And and he, he hesitated. He's like, I think it's okay for me to talk about it now. I mean, it's been like 30 years or something. And and he started talking about it a little bit. And I'm like, so you knew where they were? And he's like, yeah, I was the radio guy. So he was one wow. of the four who actually knew where they were going. And I, sorry, Steve, if you're listening. At first, I wasn't totally sure to believe him. I was like, you know, kind of anybody can claim anything about these secret missions or whatever. But he starts showing me all this, uh, all these pictures he have of these subs with the device on the back before it went over there and how they retrieved the device and all stuff. And one of the pictures, which is great, and we can we can post this so that if people are listening to this, they can see it. Actually, we'll we'll put it on the website. One of the pictures is of the sub with this device that has been built in ocean engineering at the Pink Palace in the island on the back of the sub. And if you look up, there's no traffic on the bridge. This is under the Golden Gate Bridge. There's no traffic whatsoever on the Golden Gate Bridge. They had shut it down because some congressman wanted a picture of this thing, but they didn't oh, want no. the public to see it, so they had shut down the bridge. And here's this thing come through and all these people had signed it, you know, to Steve. Thanks for all your work on the boat and all this different stuff. And you're just like, wow. You mean, you've been fixing our 110 outlets, like, (laughs) you know, grounding issues on our 110 outlets for the last 10 years. And you've never mentioned to me that you were on a sub that was doing. You've seen the beer. You know Uh, the name of it. Yeah. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff that creeps up on you. You know, what's an interesting story is how did that mission all crumble? Well, yeah. So. I, and let me, I, I'll get my numbers wrong on this a little bit. There was a guy, apparently, he, he worked uh, for the NSA. He apparently was $10,000 in debt. Oh, no. He walked into the Soviet embassy, and he said, uh, for $10,000, I've got a really good secret for you. And apparently, the KGB negotiated with him and got him down to $5,000. Wow. And he sold out the entire program for $5,000. Yeah. And the, the Soviets um, raised this device. 
It actually sits in the Great Patriotic War Museum mm. um, over in Moscow. And I've seen a picture of it, and there's a little emblem next to it. It's in Russian. I sent it to a friend of mine who speaks Russian, asked him to translate it. And it basically says in there, uh, silly Americans thought they could tap our, our cable, and we found it. We sent fake messages through it, found it, and put it in this museum. They neglect to mention that for nine years, we listened to everything that was going on. Of course, there. yeah. And just, you know, history's written by the winners a little bit, you know, on right. the whole thing. Or whoever found it, I guess, is the... I have so many more questions, but I want to read the book. I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> I'm, so I'm going good. to my it's library really today. The, the book deserves a movie, and it's so good. And seriously, when you get done, yeah. come to the Brewing Company. I'll invite you to meet. There'll be like six or seven people from that book that are still hanging around that they oh, can come cool. down and say hello. Yeah, and they're, they all read the book, and that's when they put all the dots together on this thing. Oh, wow. Because yeah. you're saying there were so many people in the dark. Yeah, oh. they didn't know. That's I, mean, I mean, a lot of them, I think, went a little crazy because of what they were doing on these submarines over all the years, and they never knew... And they found out what they actually accomplished, you know, 20, 30 years ago on these submarines. And they're like, wow, you know, it was worth every bit of it sure. know, to do that. So. Yeah. And when Sherry was telling me about her experience in OE, she just. This is the hydraulic sandwich. The hydraulic one. sandwich, Sherry. Thank you. She's the one that just said, um, you just got to read this book, Blind Man's Bluff. She goes, I don't know how in the hell they ever got it published. Because some of that stuff in there, she goes, I can't say it's true, but I don't know how in the hell they got it published. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Read the book. I love the dedication to the to the confidentiality too. That it's just so ingrained that after all these years, they're like, "Nope, not talking." Certainly not to a brewer who just wants to slap <laughs> yeah, it on a label. Yeah. Even though my yeah, motives, yeah. our motives are good here, but uh, right. this, is, this is this is not this is not the president releasing the information to be sold. That's to be right. Told. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I believe we're moving on to well, a lot of stories about the island. But what about the uh, survivor's tale? Oh, oh, great, great one. Actually, this is one that is near and dear to me is the uh, the USS Indianapolis. So if you guys don't know about the USS Indianapolis, it was the it was Truman's um, star of the fleet. It earned 10 battle stars. And how you get a battle star is you go in and out of battle and you get you get out of it. You win it. You, you can move on. And um, the Indianapolis, I believe it came in and out of Mare Island three different times during World War II, and it was um, a major force in the Pacific Theater. And the last time it was coming in uh, to Mare Island, it had been hit by a kamikaze plane where it, the kamikaze plane crashed through the bow and killed nine sailors, but the uh, ship was able to make it on its own power and limp back to Mare Island. When it got back to Mare Island, all the, all the sailors got off, and they were doing the repair. And then one day they got this message, everybody needs to report back to the ship and get on. We're heading out. And they, uh, no one knew what, what, why this, um, this was so important. They take the, the ship, and they run, run out to Hunter's Point, and they pick up a secret package out at Hunter's Point. And then they race from Hunter's Point out to Hawaii. And today it's still the fastest traverse from the mainland to Hawaii hmm. uh, to this date. And from Hawaii, they refueled and got extra provisions and then went out to Tinanen Island. At Tinanen Island, they dropped off these secret components and then carried on um, unescorted to meet up with the rest of the fleet in Guam. Well, while they were um, in, in the waters between uh, Tinanen and Guam, they, a Japanese submarine found them, fired four torpedoes at it. Two of them hit the bow, and there was 1,196 sailors on board. Uh, they estimate around 885 of them hit the water. And for five days, no one knew that this ship was sunk. And after five days, 316 of them were rescued. And if you guys have seen Jaws, it's yeah. the story where... The sailors were picked off by sharks. I they, remember this. Yeah, they ended up, uh, you know, dying from their original injuries. And um, come to find out, what those secret components were was the parts for Little Boy, Little Boy, the okay. bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and actually helped to uh, end the war. In in essence, in, in the Japanese surrender. So, so, despite the tragedy, a fully successful mission was yeah. completed, and then they're on to their next leg. Exactly. Okay. And so, uh, the reason now we understand is that they were unescorted is because it was such a top secret mission that nobody else, um, when they didn't arrive at their port of call, um, the commanding officer said, ignore it. They're probably um, on their way to somewhere else, which in fact they weren't. They were in the middle right. of the ocean. And so um, fast forward now to 2014, 10 years ago, when we were just about to open up the, um, the first ferry tap room there, and uh, we get a call from this young lady, and she says, hi, you know, my name's Peggy Campos, hey Peggy, and said that my dad was one of the survivors on the USS Indianapolis, oh and this year is the 69th anniversary for our uh, reunion that we hold in Indianapolis every year, 
And this year's theme is the San Francisco Bay Area. And she said, because the boys really love their time when they were, because that was the last piece of U.S. soil they stepped off of before, this, before right. this event. And so she said, I'd loved, we were, we were doing some research and found that you guys are starting a brewery. And I thought this would just be such a great thing to get your guys' beer out to Indianapolis for the guys. Mm-hmm. At the time, there were around 37 of the survivors remaining. That sounds right. And then, um, but one of the things is we hadn't even produced our first beer. We were still <laughs> oh. putting we were still putting up uh, the bar and everything around. So one thing I did have is I had our logo pint glasses that I'd ordered, and I said, Peggy, I said I-, I don't have beer for you, but what I can do, and I don't know if you know, shipping beer across interstate lines is not easy, right? Specifically for a small brewery not even having beer yet. So we shipped out thirty seven of the logo pint glasses, and she reached back to me after the event said. The guys loved it. We enjoyed Anchor Steam in it. I thought there we was, go. Yeah, and yeah. I thought that was a really good uh, San Francisco Bay beer to enjoy. And I said to her, I said, Peggy, you know, I'm going to make a beer for you guys because this story needs to be told. One thing, I knew of the story. My dad was a big naval history buff, but I didn't know of the depths of this story. Mm-hmm. And so we created our Survivor's Tale Pale Ale, and it's not about the, it's not about the survivors. It's if, if the survivors hadn't survived, we would have not known any of this story that, right. that had happened with that. And so, um, ironically enough, there is only one survivor remaining right now. Really? And, and his name is Harold Bray, and Harold lives in Benicia. Okay. And they actually just erected a statue, um, and he is 97 years old, but he was one of the youngest on the ship. And crazy enough, I was talking to him, and he said, he was 17 years old when he joined the Navy. Mm-hmm. He had just gotten out of boot camp the day that FDR died. And two weeks later, he was sent to Mare Island to get on this ship. Wow. So he had only been on the ship for, I don't know, five, six days right, less than a at week. best. Amazing. And in, in the Navy for, you know, four weeks, five weeks. And then he ended up s- surviving miraculously. And I asked him, I said, where were you on the ship that you were able to survive? And he said, it was so hot out in the Pacific on that night that he got um, permission from his commanding officer to sleep up on the deck. Mm. And so he was sleeping underneath the guns, and it was like just past midnight when these uh, when these torpedoes struck. Mm-hmm. And so he was able to make it into the water, and just the story of it is incredible. You know, guys, five episodes in, you have not failed to give me the <laughs> chills, the goosebumps, at least once, every single time. The And I'm thinking, you know, he said he's 97 now. Yeah. I'm thinking about surviving something like that, being in the water like that. You're ne- he couldn't imagine he's going to live right. to be 97, let alone 47. Right. I mean, the just the dichotomy of being a 17-year-old barely in the Navy to now... A ninety, the, the longest living survivor. What a story! It, I mean, it keeps unfolding. Okay. And so <laughs> then the um, what happened the, after they saved all of the uh, the sailors in the water, the um, the Navy actually ended up court martialing the captain of the ship. The travesty. And they, his name was uh, Captain McVeigh, mm-hmm. and he was court martialed because they said he didn't follow the protocol of zigzagging to make sure, that mm. basically moving his course back and back and forth so that the Japanese sub couldn't have hit him with a torpedo. Mm -hmm. They even pulled back the Japanese uh, sub commander, uh, Hashimoto, back to D.C., and he actually testified and said, it didn't matter if you would have done these zigzags, I would have still got him just from where where it was. Mm -hmm. And so um, this poor captain, he would get Christmas cards every year from the sailors that died from their parents Mm -hmm. and just saying, you destroyed our family because of you. And so in uh, 1968, he ended up um, committing suicide oh because it was, the weight of this was just so much that every year. And um, the, even the, just the image, he, he ended up committing suicide with his revolver, mm-hmm. his service revolver, and he had the, uh, a, a toy sailor in his other hand. Oh, my. And so it goes all the way until 1996, where a young guy named, uh, a sixth grader named Hunter Scott did a full project to try to exonerate um, Captain McVeigh. And... He, yeah, because of his project from a sixth grader, Captain McVeigh was exonerated. And um, so, fast forward to uh, <sighs> 2015. I've created that. We've created the Survivor's Tale Pale Ale. I, uh, I told Peggy I'd love to get some out there, and she said we'd love to have you. And so it was the 70th anniversary of the event. I ended up getting in front of the 500 in the room. I mean, there mm-hmm. was you know major star admirals there. 
the um, the wife and the daughter of the Japanese sub captain was there because they're part of this organization, yeah. of this event. And um, I got up and and released this survivor's tale pale ale. And then I'll never forget the admiral that came up after me. <laughs> he said, "You know, they say in show business that you never follow an animal act or a child act." He goes, "I never thought I'd come up here following a beer commercial." <laughs> and so, yeah. um, but one of the things that has um, continued to to make this story magical is they never found this ship and okay. so the, until paul allen of microsoft uh microsoft, bill, bill gates's partner yeah, founding partner he put together a uh a expedition and there was a, a the captain's name was robert Kraft, and they found the ship on august 19th in 2017 so fast forward to i think it was around october of that year i get an email out of nowhere and it's from robert Kraft's wife Okay. And again, I hadn't. I didn't know about this. The ship being found yet because it hadn't gotten public. And she said, "Hey, um, my husband is the captain of the ship. We uh, just found the Indianapolis, and we want to get some of this survivor's tale out to the crew for to celebrate us finding this ship." So, of course, we stopped everything, tried to figure out how to get it out into the middle of the. the that uh, was the most expensive <laughs> shipping in yeah. the history of shipping <laughs> by helicopter. I mean, what is happening? And so we ended up getting it to a port. They got it out to themselves, and then um, about three months later. I get an email from Robert, the captain himself, and he said, we're sending you guys a special gift. He said, we had four full-blown schematics of the Indianapolis that we used on the ship hmm. so that we could reference if we saw anything down there and see the exact um, dimensions of everything. And he said, we, as soon as we found it, we all, all the crews signed the four different ones. We're going to give one, uh, they gave one to another uh, Indianapolis uh, survivor, they gave one to the uh, Indianapolis committee, and then they gave one to us. And so wow. we have a framed, yeah, uh, on the wall. framed version of this um, of this schematic of the Indianapolis from the crew that found it. And so um, <laughs> you guys just became the coolest brewery now. <laughs> yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> the uh, so a c- couple shout outs here is is because of the work that we've done, um, I have been deemed an honorary survivor of the Indianapolis, which I'm very very um, grateful for mm. because it's again we're making beer, but this these stories have to be told. Yeah. And um, a a dear friend of mine, Sarah Vladek, she did a documentary called The Legacy. And what that movie is, is for 10 years, and this was before I was involved in it, she got a hold of every survivor and sat them down and got their video oral history Mm. of of what they remembered about it, how it was, and put together this awesome uh, documentary. And we ended up doing a a two-day screening in the Mare Island uh, Museum when it was still open. Yeah. And um, it was sold out both nights. Uh, Harold was there. There was two other survivors that were still around that came. And after the final showing of that, Harold and the other honorary survivors um, pretty much pinned me an honorary survivor. Wow. And um, ever since then, it's just been, continues to be one of the stories that we will always tell and to make sure that these guys um, are, are remembered. And and to me, th- that's why you were pinned. Like you said, hey, you know, we're just making beer, but the story needs to be told. But you're helping to facilitate that. I joke about that here on the Brewing Network, too. Like people say, oh, you've, you've done such a great job. And I'm like, you know, I just talk about people getting drunk for a living. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. all I do. And they try to tell me, no, you're facilitating something different, you know, some companionship, some, this socialness. And so you guys are helping to do that. That's that's what the pin is for. You guys are doing a good job of helping tell the story. And if I can remember the statistics that there were 37 survivors that were alive when you did the initial trip Correct. out there to Indiana, Indianapolis. And then when we did the um, the full length documentary release, they had twenty one that they knew of that existed. And if I remember right, number twenty two that they didn't know hmm. was alive showed up. He hadn't he hadn't been a part of it for years. And he, oh, he, he was came, in San, he, he was in San Francisco. It was uh, Tony King. Yeah, yeah. And so you know he comes in, and so we actually added to the survivor count during wow. this this move, which is really cool. And then. Then, you know, about an hour later, I like this is how this goes. This has been Ryan's baby all along, which has been awesome. But I was cleaning up folding chairs over in the corner and I look over and there's all these dignitaries huddled around Ryan, you know, bestowing the pin upon him. And yeah. I, I even teared up from over there, but I just of kept course. I just I just kept folding up my chairs over there in the corner. <laughs> so Ryan stayed in close touch. But like we said, there's only one left. Yep. And uh, we, we we donated along with a whole bunch of other people to help make that statue possible over in Benicia. You guys should go check it out. 
the uh, the watch on the wrist. What was the what was the significance Ooh. of that? Yeah, well, the, so the watch on the on on the wrist of the statue is the uh, exact watch that Harold had, and it stopped at the time that he hit the water. That's the story. Yes. That's the story. Yeah, and so yeah, it's it's. It, and it's a, it's of Harold as a young man, as a 17-year-old sail, sailor. And as yeah. they were doing this unveiling, you know, there's Harold 80 years later, you mm-hmm. know, sitting there with his family. And, um, wow. I mean, it, again, this story just, just brings chills. You should know, we, we brought Harold to the tap room kind of in between when we had the Indianapolis uh, reunion and then when we did the, the full-length documentary. Right. And Harold came and we did our very first ever speaker series, historic, right. historic speaker series. And uh, Harold got up there and told the story and we had just kind of set up chairs in this kind of random stadium seating in the tap room and patrons are coming in that don't know what it is and they're trying to figure out what's happening or whatever. And he starts in on this story and I, I do remember his, I, you know, he was, he was quite a bit older, but his wife was prompting him on a few things right. and kind of helping him through some of the story or he was, you know, pausing and she kind of helped him pick back up. But I don't think there was a dry eye on the place. It, no, it no. was an amazing moment in the history of the brewing company watching him tell that story. And, and I think the the pilot had, sh- had yeah, sh- his daughter. Um, so the the way that these guys were found is apparently this uh, plane was going through and just basically doing um, you know reconnaissance through that area and saw a shimmer of the oil and the gas on mm-hmm. the water and went down to take a look and saw these pods of guys in different areas over like a couple mile stretch. Oh wow! And he called back and said, "Hey, I'm I'm damn sure that these are Americans out there." And they're like, and the headquarters were like, "There's there's no ship that's been lost because again." No way. The, in, the India yeah. was taken off the map as far as like where it was in the world. And so, yeah, his, uh, they call his name was Chuck Gwynn and they all refer to him as angel Gwen because mm-hmm. he dropped out of the sky and found them mm-hmm. in the water. And, uh, yeah, his daughter, uh, came to that, to that event. And, and that was the first time Harold had met that daughter. If I remember right now, uh, I, I think they definitely knew from the, oh, from, they did? Okay. yeah. I just remember the reunion was tearful. I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Yeah, it, he didn't know she was coming to that event, um, but they, they definitely knew each other before then. And then, you know, kind of back to the Indianapolis in this time when it was getting the bomb together for Little Boy. Again, nobody knew it was happening. Um, if I believe right, it had half of the world's enriched uranium right. um, w- was welded into the ship's captain's quarters. Oh. Um, and basically, the captain who didn't really know what was going on as well was told if the ship goes down, this goes down with it. Like I you, see, yeah. And I, what, did, weren't we looking up how much it cost at the it time? Was, I think it was three hundred million dollars in those in those dollars. We're talking nineteen forty dollars, right? And it was half of the world's enriched uranium was on board this ship, and they they basically just said at all cost, you know, you've got to you've got to save this thing, salvage it. And this is the, the parts for this bomb were over in this building on Mare Island, waiting to be boarded onto the Indianapolis. Right where that taco truck is, that yeah. I think we've already talked about, where you can go get it, you can go get the atomic taco. We, we, yeah, yeah, and we so did talk about that. It's like you know, it just this, this, and all this was sort of super top secret. You know, this yeah. didn't, this wasn't public for years. People don't even know about it. It's yeah. wild. Well, the um, I was going to say the the uh, other part of this is when I went to the um, the that reunion in twenty fifteen. It was yeah, twenty fifteen. I got to meet Hunter Scott, the young man, the sixth grader who got Captain McVeigh exonerated, and he's now in the Navy, full on like and, and has moved up the chains just because of his dedication to the story, the Navy, and his, yeah. his service to the country. So hats off to Hunter. Absolutely was. He from a military family. Do you know where he got this idea? You know that I'm not really sure, that's um, but that's a great question as well. Because um, you know, at seven years old, I'm, I'm like Hot Wheels and, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and Transformers, maybe lightsabers. Yeah, sixth grade, not seven years old. But okay, yeah, okay, for, for fair. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then the thing, the great thing about Harold is, is you know, he went through this in, an ordeal that none of us will ever be able to understand. And then he came back and settled down in Benicia and joined the police force. Oh, and wow. He was a police officer. And apparently he was issued badge number one because he was just that he was just yeah. that much of a, a badass oh my gosh, <laughs> to be able to course. get that. Yeah. Ah, what a wonderful story. This is incredible. All right, gentlemen, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, more about Mare Island and the Mare Island Brewing Company. Hang in there. Here at the Battleships to Beer podcast, we love getting listener questions, and we get lots of them. So we're going to do our best to answer them here on this and future episodes of the show. If you've got questions, send them to podcast at mareislandbrewingco.com. And now, here are some listener questions we've received. 
Okay, here we are with our listener Q&A with Ryan and Kent. You guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping people got some good questions. They do. Karen from Calvert County, Maryland writes in, (laughs) do you guys think you would ever expand to other states with the brewery? I mean, I know your brand is based in Mare Island and the history there, but... Do you think that history could follow you into other areas? I got to take this one. Did you say Karen from Calvert? I got to take this one. There's, there's, there's first off uh, big, huge shout out for anybody calling in from the dub C. So for my friends and family back there, this is awesome to hear. Second, that's a loaded question, mom. Uh, (laughs) That's, this is from my mom. Your mom wrote in a question. So, um, and, and great question because it is, it's one of those things like, does our brand translate outside of our Mare Mare Island, um, you know, microcosm here? You know, we, we did have our beer out in Utah for a little bit. And, um, you know, there, there are different like Vallejo streets around and different naval bases that maybe, but I don't know, Ken, it's kind of hard. Like we've always just really concentrated in the Bay area because that's where the story resonates the most. Yeah. I would have to say that um, that would be my big, hairy, audacious goal someday is, yeah, Maryland is so important and we've done such a good job regionally that we're ready to expand and spread that gospel elsewhere. But we got a lot of work to do in the in the 30 square miles around us right now before we can get there. So I think it's going to be a while. I have a feeling uh, mom just wants you back home. I was going to say 2,700 miles away, mom is, uh, is missing her boy and I appreciate it. Thanks, mom. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Fair enough. If you've got questions, send them into podcast at com. All listeners can write in, including Ryan's mom. <laughs> now, back to the show. Welcome back to Battleships to Beer, 10 years of Mare Island Brewing Company. And so, guys, clearly this episode is about sort of the, the military and, and wartime history of, of Mare Island. We covered some of the Cold War. Of course, we've been talking about World War II. Um, you know I love this stuff. Can we go back to World War One? Yeah, let's go well, way let's, back. Let's let's connect the two. How's that? Uh, yeah, yeah. The USS Ward, which we've already talked about, built in record time, destroyer, seventeen and a half days on Mare Island. It's built at the end of World War One. It doesn't really see any action. Fast forward to World War Two. It's December sixth in Hawaii, outside Pearl Harbor, and the Ward is now an old ship. It's never really seen any action. It's got a very young crew on it. Uh, in part kind of a training crew, if I understand it right. And they're basically patrolling the waters outside of Hawaii, uh, outside of Pearl Harbor, and they see a periscope. And they have these they have these rules of engagement that allow them, they fire and they sink this thing. Oh. And they report it back in, and they say, we think we just sunk a, a submarine out just outside the subnets here on, on the um, Pearl Harbor. And nobody believes them. They won't believe them because the ship is so old, these, these <sighs> sailors are so young and everything else. And that was just a couple hours oh, no. before the planes came in on Pearl Harbor on December 7th. And if they had believed them, we, we, we they, it would have been a the warning. Assumption the assumption is, yeah. yeah. And it, I believe it wasn't until years later when they actually raised the sub. It was a little one or two man Japanese sub, these cool little subs that they had that were just incredibly dangerous. Okay. And um, yeah, they raised it. And they found out that the, the ward had. So oh. it, the ward, which is both the fastest built ship ever it was built in world war one actually fired the first shots of the united states in world war two which Jeez, is kind of cool that is very cool yeah uh, how things could have been just it's amazing how a split second decision how a just one tiny thing could change history yeah you know i mean you got to think though again the communication was spotty like how do you tie all of these things together and just come up with they're gonna pearl harbor's about to happen yeah you know? like of that's, course yeah i don't know there's a there's a story to speak to what you were just talking about that if you come to the chapel on Mare Island there is a, a plaque to the USS Maine and th- this one blows me away every time I see it and the Maine was so we were a non-interventionist country at the end of the Revolutionary War mostly because of Hamilton saying we don't want to contribute to anybody else where we got enough deal stuff to deal with on our own we have the USS Maine is down in Havana Cuba and it gets sunk by the Spanish and it drags us into the Spanish American War and arguably creates us as a or it triggers us to become an interventionist country that continues on to this day that the Maine was eventually raised, brought to Mare Island to be fixed. And as they were looking to fix it, they realized it wasn't sunk by, by, by the Spanish. It was oh. a boiler explosion oh. that had happened. So we were triggered into the Spanish American war, changed our entire foreign policy outlook by a malfunction, by a mistake. Oh my. And there's a plaque that they, they melt. They eventually they couldn't even use the ship. They melted it down and they made a plaque out of this one little small section of it for that. But yeah, that kind of major, yeah. I mean, 
side light, but that that's the kind <laughs> no, of stuff. No, that's as well. exactly what I'm talking about. These these seemingly tiny events are massive. We actually had um, not to speak about a whole ship, but just a gun turret. And you're gonna have to bear with me on this on this a little bit because I got to connect some dots. There's a guy that was coming to speak about. Uh, he was he worked at JPL uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratories and his job his day job he was a nuclear scientist his day job was to go back to the Super 8 films of the nuclear testing that was done back with the Trinity test etc mm-hmm. and enhance those films so they could do more exact measurements through the visuals that they got basically because we can't test nuclear weapons anymore so they right. would, they're testing them again through basically making better enhancement of this Super 8 film. So he goes down because he had to do some measurements, I guess, down to the site where this um, where they had these tests and he finds a gun turret. And I'm talking like one that would be on a battleship. So imagine three, you know, barrels sticking out. And this thing is, you know, four feet long, yeah. yeah, massive, super heavy sitting in the middle of the desert where this test was. Two of the barrels are filled with concrete. The other one's filled with concrete, but it has a really small pipe going down the middle of it. And he realizes they had put the device to measure the blast within the confine, the protective confines of this gun turret. And it had this little measurement aperture that went out and pointed at the the nuclear weapon, which was like a mile mile away or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how the hell did this gun turret get here? So he goes over and and he just just kind of scrubs at the corner. He finds a serial number, looks it up. Lo and behold, it's from Mare Island. Oh, wow. So he comes to Mare Island. He does a bunch of research down at the foundation. He finds out that these things were like plug and play back in World War II. They kept a bunch of them basically on the dock down at Mare Island and went up. Ship would have trouble out at sea and get, you know, hammered by kamikazes or whatever. They'd pull up, they'd crane the old one, damaged one off, and they'd pick up a new one and they'd put it back on there. I see. He traces this thing back to the Lucky Lou, which is the Lo- the Louisville, and he finds out that it was damaged in this, I forget the name of the battle, but it was a battle in the Philippines. And he finds out that there is Super 8 footage ah. from the USS California, which was built on Mare Island, of a kamikaze hitting the Lucky Lou and causing the damage to this turret that That's later right. ended up at the, at the atomic bomb test. So then he takes the super eight footage. And he's like, well, I'll, takes it to work and says, Hey guys, we got to enhance the super eight footage. Yeah. He shows this on Mare Island for the first time. And he goes frame by frame by frame. First time anybody's ever seen this. And as the kamikaze's coming in two frames before the kamikaze, you see the kamikaze pops his, his canopy hmm. jumps out, runs to the end of his plane. wing, what? tries to deploy a parachute and save himself before his plane <sighs> crashes into it. So not all the kamikazes were kamikazes. Yeah, they had a plan, the the some day. of them. Yeah. And so, like, this is the kind of discoveries that are still going on to this day on this stuff. I got to see this video. And it all ties, but yeah, if, if you Google, you can see it now. He, he, he basically announced this on Mare Island at a part of a speaker series. And then um, this has all been kind of published since then. But uh, the, and the great question somebody asked from the audience was, hey, why does a kamikaze have a parachute if they're, they're a kamikaze? Well, apparently uh-huh. the seats were really uncomfortable and the kamikazes talked their commanding officers into using them as seat cushions. They okay. could sit on them. Okay. And that's how he had one with him. But he did not survive. He actually, the, the, the zero, the kamikaze, ended up wrapped around the gun turret dead. Um, so it didn't work out for him. Sure. But the fact that he tried. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's new information that everyone wasn't just uh, resigned to die in their plane crash. Yeah. Ooh. It was something else. Lucky Lou. And Lucky tra- Lou. Gosh, tracking down this turret like that. This history is incredible. And I, I just love the Super 8. And he's like, hey, guys, we got to enhance this now. And yeah. like, what, are you, what are you talking about? Oh, wow. Comes full circle. Wow. What a great story. All right. What else you got for me on the island? Well, we were going to talk about bicycles a little bit because um, we have an event called Pedal Fest that we do every year. We got a lot of events. We're going on event season now. We it just is. had Aloha Festival. Uh, we just had a Butterfly Festival with like oh. three, 4,000 people came out. These are not necessarily our events. We're kind of just partners f- on in the event, island. but on the waterfront okay. uh, right there. And we did a um, we did a decked out at the quarters event with a bunch of bands. Like we're, we're getting into the heavy season. So sure. check, the, check the website. You got to come down for some of these events. They're fantastic. But one of the ones we do is called Pedal Fest. And uh, where, where did you, you found the bike? Where did I you did find, find it? the bike? Um, so the story goes is that during World War II, did we already, I feel like, did we already touch in on this? I don't uh, think yeah, so. Yeah. Not that I remember. During World War II, you know, it went from 5,000 workers on the island to f- over 40,000 workers on the island instantly. And one of the things that was really hard to do was to get around on the island from shop to shop. So the way they kind of um, they got around it is with bicycles. And so it was kind of like the original bike share um, where each shop, they'd, they'd, ha- they'd have a little welded plate on that said what shop number it was for. And you'd get on that bike, you'd ride it to the other shop, and you'd see another bike you like, you'd get on that, you'd go back, 
And so there was just bicycles everywhere. So we've heard of these things called shop bikes. And, you know, I think we've already maybe mentioned as well, Kent and I have been in and out of a couple buildings. And, you know, yeah. we kind of have a, a checklist of things that, you know, we're like, man, if we just find one of these things. And, yeah. And shop bike was really high on yeah, it. It's super just high. Find it. And uh, one of the things that actually both Kent and I are guilty of is when we're on the phone, we kind of just pace out on the waterfront, on the waterfront. And there was a building near our, our current Coal Shed Brewery that I was kind of deep in the back on the phone looking down in this one window, and I saw a frame of a shop bike wrapped around a toilet. Uh, and interesting. I, I, I don't even remember who I was on the phone with, but I remember exactly what I said is, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> and I got off the phone. I called my security guy friend and said, hey, I need to get in here because I found something that I need to grab. And he let me in. And it literally, it's a Schwinn. I got to say it's from like the 70s. And it's just the frame. There's okay. nothing. And no wheels. No wheels, no handlebars, nope. no seat. No, uh, oh. the, 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 the pedals are still on it. And uh, it's purple. And on it's a tag that says Shop 72. It's welded on there very oh, nice yeah. and beautifully. Yeah. And resurrected this thing, wrapped around the toilet. And uh, we now have it in our in our brewery hanging up. And we made a, bu- a beer. Of course, we had to. Yes. And we call it the Shop Bike Session IPA. So, nice. Yeah, it's got to think about it. You're pedaling around the island, an IPA you can enjoy. But, yeah, the bikes are uh, – and what about the last bike on the island? Well, there was a, there was a bike they call the Lonesome Louie. And apparently it had been wrapped up with like seven cable locks and everything and lock, chain locked to this fence. So when the Navy left the island, they sold all the bikes off and everything, but nobody wanted to mess with cutting this thing loose. So it just sat there for years and years and years. And it kind of took on a life of its own. Everybody called it Lonesome Louie. And so <laughs> that one got put into the foundation to the museum, actually. And, and we have that one. But both of those bikes, our purple shop bike and the Lonesome Louie, are on display at Pedal Fest every year, which is the last week in September. And we have all these... We have these folks that come and do this this crazy race all through the island and then kids day and kids rodeo and all stuff. But it's all about bicycles. And it's funny because people, they're, they're just for fun and beer and bikes. And then Spandex. they start realizing, huh, there is like there's some really cool history to this stuff. They estimate that this one shop uh, changed over 10,000 bicycle tires per year because as Ryan and I can attest, there is no thickness of rubber on your tires that's going to keep your tires from going flat on Mare Island. Is, I, I mean, I've probably plugged my tires six, seven times in the last year. I would say you don't. I, I have, you have a, a spare on there right I now. I have don't a you? brand new tire in oh, the back do? of my truck that I just got uh, replaced <laughs> that I have to put on because of that exact. exact. There's so much just metal debris floating around the island from all this stuff. So you can imagine these people. The other thing is there's all these railroad tracks on the island. If you've ever ridden a bike over railroad tracks, if you're not hitting it 90 degrees yeah. perpendicular, you're toast and people go down right and left and there's all these stories and there used to be big signs on the island that would demonstrate in diagrams how you're supposed to cross the oh, yeah. uh, the, the railroad tracks so that people wouldn't go down on I've that. done it myself uh, out in Fort Collins, Colorado, big train town. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I knew this rule, but I kind of hit it out of 45 yeah, thinking no, I'd be fine. Not good enough. Nope. Not good enough. Yeah. It oh, I, just grabs it. Yeah. We should talk about mud puppy I was before gonna we say, run out of time. Okay. I yeah. think. And... Um, this is another beer that we make clearly. We, we do this whenever we can, but the USS Guitaro was a submarine that was built on Mare Island. It had not yet been commissioned and sent out to sea. And it was sitting out on the docks, not too far from our coal shed, just right out front, frankly. And they had two crews to go work on it. And these two crews weren't communicating with each other. And the first crew was trying to test fill the forward ballast to basically just drop the nose into the water a little bit. Mm-hmm. The um, other crew was there to test to make sure that the ship stayed or the boat stayed trim. So as the first crew filled the front ballast, the other crew filled the back ballast. And then the okay. first crew filled the front ballast more to try <laughs> to get it to go down and the back crew. And when they came back from having gone to lunch... They discovered this thing was now sitting on the mud in the bottom of the strait, fully uh, submerged in water. And so this, and nobody in it to no, nobody. No, in it, yeah, no, no yeah. Nobody was hurt. But, well, I more meant nobody in it to rectify the situation. Correct. Correct. No, they were off yeah. to lunch. They were yeah. off to lunch. <laughs> Hydraulic sandwiches. <laughs> you know? right. yeah. it, parts of the story that I love are that um, it was such an embarrassment to the people of Mare Island, the workers and the town of Vallejo, for that matter. Yeah. All of the workers on Mare Island offered to give up all of their unpaid leave that they had accrued to pay back the federal government for this mistake. Oh, wow. And they passed a hat around uh, Vallejo and they raised, I think it was $200,000, might have been $300,000 to give to the federal government to offset this mistake that they had made. Jeez. That's the kind of pride that they had in this. But they eventually um, floated this thing back up. Okay. 
cleaned it up. Like I think it took millions of dollars to clean it all up, send up and it served with distinction for like 20 years. Wow. But fast forward, we're making a brew for it. And then we did it, a fantastic yard bird party. And I, who yeah. was there? The wolf was there. The wolf was there because the wolf was on the decommissioning uh, crew that ended up taking it apart when it was finished at service. Hmm. And then we had um, what's called a plank owner. And a plank owner is if you're the first crew that goes out on a new commission ship, you are considered a plank over, uh, owner, like the planks of a deck. Okay. And so we had, I don't know, was, I know Tom was there. There's like four or five plank owners at least. and uh, the wolf who decommissioned it. And so, of course, I hear this story, and you know, it's called the mud puppy. It's it was murky that, waters. It, that just was its like common nickname. Well, it, after this, after, after this, happened. yeah, yeah. It, it was the guitaro. But the fact that it had dropped down yeah. to the bottom and got all muddy, they called it the mud puppy. And so, it just was screaming brown ale. It yeah. just needed yeah, a brown ale. Yeah. And uh, this is this is one we we release every few often. We actually have it out this year, and I, it's one that's a sneaker. We get I get asked more about yeah. this beer when it's coming back um, than not. But yeah, we we had to and. I don't know, you know, I know the age group out here is probably uh, varying and ranging, but there was a show in the 60s called Laugh-In. Uh, was that what it was? Yeah, La- I remember yeah, the yeah, show, yeah. And they had what was called the Fickle Folly of the Week. And so what that would be is some obscure, it'd probably be on BuzzFeed now, you know, or something yeah. that you would see or whatever, but it's like some obscure story around the country that they would feature on the show. And the mud puppy was featured on there because it was a folly of grand, you know, of grand scale, scale yeah, yeah. of the, how these guys on a on a submarine shipbuilding uh, base sunk it in front of. Uh, them. Yeah, still embarrassed. Yeah, even back then. I love when we did when we launched this. We drank the first mud puppy with these guys, and it was funny because the guys who had served on the mud puppy were like, "Yeah, it was brought up and it was clean till it was absolutely pristine." And then the wolf. Who's our who's our reefer guy now? But yeah. at the time, he was part of the decommissioning of this. Years later, he's like, you know, when we took those panels off from the inside, oh. there was still a ton of mud back there, <laughs> yeah. and they're like exchanging oh. these stories about this. And he's like, it wasn't as clean. So they basically carried this Mare Island mud around with them for twenty years. Oh my gosh, the submarine, a little so. extra weight, a little extra ballast in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. All right. Well, as always, you can go to MareIslandBrewingCo.com. Uh, of course, Kent mentioned all the events that, uh, that are happening. So uh, go take a look there and you can um, you know, find out when exactly to go find a fun event on Mare Island and at the Mare Island Brewing Company. Uh, you guys got a question for uh, whose turn is it this week? I think week? it's my turn this week uh, to spring uh, one on Kent. Oh, boy. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be another good softball because I'm actually um, generally curious about it. So... We're coming up on 10 years, and so what has surprised you the most from your initial business plan to where we are today in the Mare Island Brewing Company? Mm. Man, that's an excellent question. So, I, you know, honestly, on one hand, I'm not surprised at all. I felt like the partnership was solid. The economy was where we wanted it to be. Everything was 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 ready to go. Ripe. It was it was a it was a blank brown field that just needed the lightning to strike, and we were ready for the strike. So, we've gotten there. I think the the two things that are um, they're they're incongruous. In fact, one is how quickly it took off. I I could Agreed. not believe how fast we got the following and the business and the revenue and everything we needed to get started on that end. The other part of this though is how slowly everything else has moved around us during that time frame Between, on the island or in 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 not on yeah on the island literally outside our walls mm-hmm. i would say mm-hmm. like the development on the island has moved really slowly the city has moved really slowly mm-hmm. we've been through a pandemic we've had a couple economic downturns right like and i'm it's something i'm very proud of is like it, we almost had to make our own weather during all this time and so i think i'm most surprised by how quickly we got the following and how slowly everything else is. I mean, I thought if you had asked me 10 years ago, okay, if you guys are going to get to do a 10 year podcast, not that we would ever dream this up, but you guys are going to do that. You're going to talk about it. I would have said, yeah, we're going to, we'll have flying cars outside and Mare Island's going to be all built out and <laughs> yeah. my house is going to be worth seven times what it was. Right. And, you know, my kids are going to have a good school to go to. And all that has just literally dragged along. And I think we're going to try to touch on this in a future episode at one point and kind of talk a little bit about. Vallejo, which is our, our, our adopted hometown and, and beloved, but at the same time, whoo, maddening at, at the same time. But that's probably the biggest, I guess, surprise out of the whole thing. All right. That, that's a good answer for yeah. sure. Makes yeah. sense, too. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, you can send it to, what is it, Ryan? Ooh, podcast at com. There we go. Send your questions to us. We'll be happy to address them, probably on air even, so... 
Um, also, go to MareIslandBrewingCo.com to check out uh, the events list and the beers that we've been talking about and where you can find them and all of that. We also were adding a bunch of pictures that support what we're talking about on the podcast. So oh, great. When you go to the website, you'll be able to see uh, see some of these things we're talking about because it's a you know it's a audio medium, but we can show you some pictures. Too. One of my favorite ones that's going to be on there is a picture of Harold Bray, the survivor of the Indianapolis, and me with a bitchin' long uh beer beard uh-huh. and he is basically blessing the plans of the coal shed before we built it so, oh yeah. i love this you, you have to go to it just to see the beard it is <laughs> it is zz top does not even do it justice this thing <laughs> is off the charts it's nice. perfect it was ryan's homeless category uh, homeless time That's i love it. To it as. well i'm looking forward to seeing these two you guys know i'm fascinated by these stories and i'm in here uh in the studio with you guys i, I haven't even seen these photos yet so i'll be going to the same website to check it all out All right, folks. Well, thanks for hanging out with us. You've been listening to Battleships to Beer, 10 years of Mare Island Brewing Company. This is episode five. We've got more to come. So hit the subscribe button. That'll make sure uh, you get every update that we put out there. That way you don't lose your place. Uh, Just hit follow or subscribe, whichever service you're using, and that'll make sure you get the next episode as soon as we publish it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. If you want to see historical and other photos to events referenced in this podcast, head on over to the Mare Island Brewing Company website at mareislandbrewingco.com or check out the link in the show notes for this episode. Uh-huh.